Today, strategy and superheroes. Are you confused? You won't be for long. Are you ready? Let's go. Welcome to the Remarkable Leadership Podcast. We are here each week to talk about leadership, teamwork, organizational culture, and human potential with experts from every walk of life. Your host is Kevin Eikenberry, a best-selling author and leadership thought leader for 25 years. This episode is sponsored by Kevin's book, The Long Distance Leader, Rules for Remarkable Remote Leadership. Order your copy today at remarkablepodcast.com forward slash book. And now, here's your host, Kevin. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Remarkable Leadership Podcast. I'm here today with Rich Orwath, and we're going to chat. But before we do that, I got to tell you who Rich is, in case you don't know. He's a New York Times bestselling author, New York Times, Wall Street Journal, USA Today bestselling author on strategy. And he and I were just chatting that we haven't ha had a lot of conversations about strategy here on the podcast. And most recently, his book, it, his newest book is titled Strategy Man and the Anti-Strategy Squad. Yes, that's the title of the book. We're going to get to that in a little bit. Um, he's the CEO of, Strate of the Strategic Thinking Institute. He leads executive, executive teams through strategy process and has helped more than 100,000 managers around the world develop their strategic thinking skills. A former chief strategy officer and professor of strategy, he brings both real world experience and practical expertise to help leaders build their strategic capabilities. Rich, welcome. Kevin, great to be with you today. Glad you're here. I got for people that are watching us, um, and if you don't know, you can watch us. But here's the here's the book. We'll get to it in a minute. And yes, it's a graphic novel. It's not like his other books. You know, books like Strategy and You and Elevate and Deep Dive, which sound sort of very businessy. This doesn't. Um, but before we, before we get to all of that, Rich, tell us a little bit about how you got to this place. Uh, tell us a little bit about your business, but tell us about your path. Yeah, so about 20 years ago, I was working for a marketing consulting firm, and I was doing a lot of strategic planning. And at one of the breaks uh, with a client organization, one of the mid-level mid managers came up to me and said, you know, Rich, I just had my performance review, and my boss said that I'm too tactical. I need to be more strategic. How do I go about doing that? And so I said, well, let me check and see, see if I can find some research on that. So I did research on, you know, being strategic. And, and Kevin, as you know, most of the books back then were really about corporate strategy, you know, the, the, the 500, 600 page books from Porter, which are great books, but really about corporate strategy. There was really very little about how do you as an individual leader be more strategic day in and day out. So that was kind of the, the light bulb moment for me that said, you know, this is really an area that's underexplored and really people could use a good roadmap, some frameworks and tools to help them be more strategic day in and day out. So 16 years ago, I started my own organization and it's been a great journey since then. I've worked with a lot of wonderful people and really, again, just trying to help the individual managers and leaders out there go from tactical thinking to being more strategic, seeing that big picture and really being able to set strategic direction. Yeah, and you're right. Strategy is one of those words that everyone throws out there. And people say, well, I gotta be, we got to be strategic and not tactical. But in my experience, most people don't really know what that means. Yeah, you're, you're exactly right. And the research supports what you're saying, Kevin. I mean, the reality is less than half of organizations say that they have a consistent understanding of what strategy is and a, and a common language for it. And I think that's because strategy is abstract. You know, it's like leadership or love. You can't reach out and touch it. So it takes on a lot of different meanings for people. So um, what's something, you know, in that 16 year journey, what's something that uh, maybe, what, what's maybe one of the most surprising things? that you've learned about strategy or that you're, that you're able to maybe, maybe one of the things that surprises people when you start sharing some of this with them. You know, I think one of the surprising things that I've found and, and other folks have found as well is that oftentimes strategy and the other kind of big word innovation, 
You know, they're, 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 they're really kind of separate from one another. Strategic, no, strategic innovation. We can hook them together, Rich. Right, there you go. Exactly. I like that. That's good creativity. Uh, but, we've, but what you see is most companies, they have a department for strategy or they have, you know, marketing people do strategy and then they'll have an innovation group. And what I've found over the years is that the foundational part of strategy and innovation is the same thing. It's insight. It's that, uh, it's that ability to create new value. And I think strategy and innovation both come from that common core, that common seed. And I think that surprises a lot of people because most folks keep them separate, either mentally or even physically in their companies. Okay, this is a spoiler alert. What I'm about to say is, uh, you know, is, um, well, <laughs> what I'm about to say, I'm just going to say it. I was going to give you a spoiler alert. I'm not going to do it. And it, it, I believe that one of the reasons, I mean, along with knowing some things that you can teach us, one of the reasons that people aren't good at strategy, because you use the word insight, one of the reasons people aren't good at strategy is they don't take time to stop and think. Can I get an but amen on that? thinking going on. Can we, you know? Amen to that, Kevin. You're so right, because we're, we're in such an activity-driven world today. We're tethered to each other electronically 24-7. We're very reactive. And, and to your point, what I've seen is the great leaders really do carve out time intentionally to stop and think, and they don't just caught, get caught up in the activity like a bumper car moving from one thing to the next. Oh, I love that metaphor. The bumper car metaphor is a great metaphor for activity. Be, the, I, I use the word busy. People use the word busy, and then you know it's like a, some sort of badge of honor, and it and it sort of um, is a pass, right? Oh, I was busy. Oh, man, I know. I was busy too. And if we're doing that, we're not going to get to strategy. It's really interesting because it's great as you and I are having this conversation, which is a while before everyone else is going to see it. But I've been spending a lot of time doing this myself and with some of our team around some, some new things. And so it's very timely for me personally. Uh, so we're talking about strategy. We're talking with Rich Horwath, and, and you've written a bunch of books, but the new book, Strategy Man and the Anti-Strategy Squad um, is a graphic novel. So like, okay, my, so my first question is, why, and so if you're watching, you can see it. And if you're not, you just need to go order a copy. Uh, but why did you choose, like, talk about how you ended up here at a graphic novel. Yeah, you know, it's, I, I've got two teenage kids, young, young teens. And the interesting thing for them, and, and anybody out there who's got kids knows, they're so visually oriented. The first thing they do when they go online is they go to YouTube and they're watching videos. If they want to learn how to do something, they go, they, they find a video to do it. So it just seems like more and more today, people are very visually oriented. And so I said to myself, well, you know, how can we make strategy more visual? Because um, as you said, I've written a few books on strategy already, but I wanted to try to reach people that may not, you know, may not be able to sit down and, and read a, a book from front to back, you know, that's just text driven. So I figured this would be an interesting approach to at least try and see if, if we can engage people maybe at a, at, a, at a visual level as well as kind of that intellectual level. So strategic innovation, perhaps. Um, yeah. <laughs> sorry, I couldn't. I love it. So, so um, I mean, I, as an author, and I mean, I, we could have a whole long conversation about the creation of the book and all that, which would be interesting to me. It might not be interesting to everyone else, but I, but I do want to talk, tell us a little bit about, without giving it away, tell us a little bit about the storyline and what's going on or what's happening in the book. Can you do that a little bit? Give us a teaser. Yep. So Technobody is a wearable technology company and they realize that their strategic plan is dying. It's actually visually on life support. And so they wonder why is it dying? And what they find is that with the help of Strategy Man, the, the main superhero in this book, that they're being attacked by the Anti-Strategy Squad, which is a group of 20 villains or, or challenges. And what I did is I did research on the top 20 challenges that managers face, things like fire drills, bad meetings, too many priorities. And I personified each of those into a villain or character. So fire drills would be fire driller. Uh, bad meetings would be the meeting menace. And in each chapter of the book, the managers, along with some of the superheroes, are battling these strategy challenges that they face. And then at the end of each chapter, we sit down and we talk about what were some of the key learnings. And then what's a tool that you can use 
to, in your own work to, to be more effective strategically against some of those things? So I, I can tell you, everybody, I have a copy. I, my copy, um, if you look closely, it says uncorrected galley proof, which means, I mean, it may not be the perfect version, but it's visually beautiful. It is a graphic novel, but as Rich and I said before we started, it's for people of our age, it's like a comic book. So yep. here's the thing. I, I, my observation is that there are people out there that say, hey, I'm not really a reader uh, that might really grasp onto this, which is, which is sort of your, your first point. But my other point is, I think that any of you who say, well, I, I like to read regular books, um, I clearly like to do that. I could scan you around this office and show you all the books on the, on the walls. Um, but I think that, you know, you, you don't have to not read this because this is different or whatever, because I think the content here is really, really, really good. Um, so, so I just want to applaud you for that. And I want to just encourage everyone to go ahead and don't worry about it. Like if you don't read, you want one. And if you do read regular stuff, it's okay to read something different. You'll even, <laughs> right. you'll even look cool to your kids or your grandkids. Right. It's possible, right? It is possible. Uh, maybe Rich really wrote this, everybody, because he wanted to look cool to his kids. I don't know. <laughs> um, so um, I, I want to talk about strategy in general. Um, I, I, as I was preparing, I was, I was thinking about these two words because you, you talked about this a little bit already. I mean, you hinted at this idea. There's strategy and then there's strate strategic thinking. And I think for those of us who lead at any level in an organization that's not, especially if we're in a big organization that we're not at the top, we're not at that strategy retreat or whatever. Like, can we talk about the difference between strategy and strategic thinking? Yeah, Kevin, you bring up a great point because I think oftentimes, like you said, if we're a mid-level manager or maybe we're just starting out, we're not necessarily having a seat at the table to develop the strategy. But, but that doesn't mean that we can't contribute to the strategy. And so to your point, you know, strategy is really the, the, the company or the business's plan to achieve their goals, the, the financial goals, the cultural goals, the performance goals. So the strategy really lays out how are we going to get from A to B. Strategic thinking, on the other hand, is something that everybody can contribute to. So strategic thinking is really your ability as a manager to generate new insights, new ideas, on how you can bring value to customers. And those customers can either be internal to your organization or external. So everybody out there working has insights each day. The challenge is we don't necessarily record them, we don't write them down, we don't share them with other people so they go unnoticed. And that's why I think so many companies are not maximizing the intellectual potential that they have because they're not tapping into their employees insights and ideas on how can we do better? How can we bring new value to the folks that we're, that we're serving? So if strategic thinking is about, if, if the core of that is insight, which is yep. awesome, um, then I have two tactical questions. First of all, I'm a leader or whoever I am in the organization. And I ha how, how do I, well, or how do you capture those insights? Because I'm right with you. We're thinking all the, well, we're, we're busy, but I mean, but we do have insights. We do have thoughts. And if we don't capture them, they do definitely get lost. So let's talk about that for a, as an individual. How do we do that? Yeah. So, yeah. So great point um, because that's really the, the real world application. And so as I've looked at and studied leaders like uh, Bill Gates, when he was leading Microsoft, Steve Jobs, when he was at Apple, even Jeff Bezos, who's leading Amazon today, what I found is that they, one of the common threads is they all write, write down and have written down their ideas. And so really the most important thing is that you capture the idea. So if you have an app on your phone, a note section or Evernote or one of those electronic ways you can do that, I still see a lot of leaders carrying around uh, physical journals or physical day planners. Yeah, exactly. Exactly, Kevin. So, you know, it's, it's really not as important where you capture it is that the fact that you're doing it in a convenient way for you. Some people even jot them down in emails or text messages and then they send them themselves. The key, though, is, is not only writing them down, but then, as you talked about earlier, really carving out that time later on to stop, review them, and then think about what do these mean to me? Even Jeff Bezos leading Amazon takes one day a quarter with no email, no phone, and he goes through his notes and ideas from that quarter, and he says, you know, how can I use these to make the company better? So, you know, we as individual managers at all levels need to be able to stop, write those things down, and then go back and look at them. 
Okay, so that's fantastic. And, and so it doesn't matter how we want to do it, do it however you want, but don't lose them. Put them on a post-it note. I don't care. As long as those post-it notes get put someplace where they can all be, be captured. I was thinking back, and I can't remember, the, I think the guy who started Domino's, his name was Monahan, if I remember right. Um, right. I remember reading his biography years ago, and he was out hustling to, to get Domino's going. And th um, three ring binder, you know, pages, same thing. Page after page after page of ideas, continue to go back to him uh, to say, you know, some of them may be, some of those insights may be tactical. They may not all be strategic in nature, but all of them um, com may comprise where we're, help us head where we need to head, right? Exactly. You know, uh, Edward Tuft, he's a, he's a Yale researcher and, and, and very good on data communication. He said the act of arranging information is an act of insight in and of itself. So to your point, you know, once we've got all these ideas written down somewhere, when we go back, you're, you're absolutely right. We're going to have to filter. Some of them aren't going to make sense. Some of them aren't going to be valuable, but it's those two or three hidden gems that really can make a difference in the business. Because I'm a big believer today, Kevin, that we're not paid for our experience for 20 years or 25 years. That's important. But what we're paid for is our expertise. And in, in my experience, expertise is really built on insights. And if we're not collecting them, we're not coming up with those new ideas, we're not really we're not really increasing our value well that's the difference you know the old the old joke of the difference between the person who has 20 years of experience or one year of experience 20 times right um <laughs> and, and so i think that's i think that's exactly right so now um how do we then how do we do that as a leader with our teams like what are your recommendations okay you can say here, kevin here's what you need to do to be collecting those insights and you ought to be reflecting on them and and arranging them I got a little side thought maybe we'll come back to you on that but how do you help your team do that or how do you collect those insights from the team to get at those more strategic conversations yeah so it's a, it's a great question there's two ways that i've seen people be successful the first way is to create accountability for insight so some of the tech companies i've worked with out west in silicon valley they actually as part of their performance reviews each month or sometimes each quarter, they're responsible for contributing three to five insights, new ideas on ways to create value. And they've got to, they've got to surface those up to leadership and then leadership, then leadership shares those with the rest of the organization. So each month, each quarter, lots of new ideas are bubbling up and then they're shared. And the second way I was going to mention is that some companies are creating these insight networks. So they're actually creating, um, physical communications, whether it's digital or, or physical within the organization, so that insights are shared throughout the company on an ongoing basis. And so people are really getting new ideas, they're building on other people's ideas in real time. So I think creating accountability and then creating that insight network are really two ways that I've seen leaders successfully take those insights and, and actually act on them. So two, two questions that that raises uh, for me. One, one is, how do, how do you keep, well, I'll start with the, the, this one first. You, you have been saying, using the word insights intentionally, I'm quite sure. Um, and then a minute ago, though, you said insights or ideas. Why have you chosen the word insights over ideas? And I have some thoughts about that, but I'm sure that was a conscious choice. Talk about that and what's the, if there's a difference, what the difference is. Yeah, it's a great distinction. So insight tends to be something that, um, that, that starts with an idea, but then it, it's actually transformed into value. So, so we can have ideas about things. Ideas are, are really kind of the raw element. So they're not necessarily going to produce anything of value yet. The insight is taking that new idea and saying, how do I transform that so it becomes valuable to my customer, to my colleague, to my boss? So the insight is really that ability to take something new and transform it into value. So you've actually done something to it already before you might share it in the network or share it with someone else, which gets at my other question, which is how, what, what's your coaching or advice for people when they share those? Now, part of it's cultural, I realize, but when they share those, other people will say, well, that's a bad idea. Right? Yeah. How do you keep the cold water from being tossed around on all those things, which are still not maybe always fully formed, right? So talk about that a little bit. 
Yeah, and you're, you're right. It's very much a cultural aspect. Um, you know, I, I'll see, I'll be in a meeting and somebody will bring up something new and people will roll their eyes or they'll kind of shake their heads silently. And you can see sometimes that they're not really accepting of that. And what I try to do is share some examples. One example, I worked with a medical device company. We were in a session brainstorming new insights. Somebody came up with an idea of a, a, a new type of product that was completely out of the realm of what they did. They were a cardiovascular company, and this was about um, OA, removing waste from the operating room. And people said, we would never do that. And you fast forward five years later, the leaders kept that idea alive, and it was a $100 million part of their business. So um, I try to share a couple stories like that when people you know, shake their heads and say no, that again, we've got to be able to build on ideas and not necessarily shut them down too early. So we started out with, so thanks for that. I, I really appreciate that. Uh, we, we started out um, talking about strategy. It's really what we've talked about throughout. And we said early on that it's kind of one of those words that everyone banters about, doesn't necessarily know what it means. Here's my sort of my last question before we shift gears. Um, what are the fallacies or myths about strategy? Is, or is there one or two of those that you'd like to dispel for everyone who's listening, who has, has a cynical thought in part about strategy? What's the myth or the fallacy that you need, we need to get rid of to help us all be more successful moving forward? Yeah, and you, and you insightfully touched on one earlier. You know, strat the first biggest one, strategy is not my job. You know, strategy is the job of the CEO. It's not my job. But when we think about what strategy is, the intelligent allocation of resources to achieve your goal, then the reality is all of us have resources. Resources are time, talent, and maybe budget. So everybody's got time and talent each week that they're spending. You're either spending it productively towards your goals or you're spending it unproductively towards other stuff that doesn't really add value. So I think the, the biggest myth I'd like to dispel is that strategy is not my job. Strategy is everybody's job. Just because strategy uh, uh, is written in a PowerPoint deck doesn't mean that people are doing it. The real strategy is how people are spending their time, their talent, and their money each and every day. So if you're a leader and you can harness everybody in the same direction in how they're spending their time and their talent, you're going to be a lot more successful. And we're much more likely to turn those strategies into realities as opposed to them being in the deck this year and next year and the year after that. <laughs> right. Um, so we are going to shift gears in the next short little section of our uh, conversation is is uh, sponsored by our new book, The Long Distance Leader. You can learn more by going to longdistanceleaderbook.com. If you are a remote leader, that's what you'd want to do, remoteleadershipbook.com. So what I've got now, Rich, is what we call the fast break. I've got three ideas, and I'm going to share the idea with you. I want you to give us your first thoughts or your reactions to it. It doesn't have to be, it does not have to be a single word. It just is a chance for you to freely riff briefly about each of these ideas. Are you ready? Sounds good. All right. The first one is budgeting. Budgeting tends to anchor us. It tends to bring us to a place that we've been in the past. And so I would say when you budgeting is obviously important, but don't let that constrain the new ideas, the innovation, the value your team can bring. Start with a blank slate, then go to the budget next. All right. Excellent. Second, change management. Change management. Tim Cook from Apple, the CEO currently, has said there's more noise than change out there. So sometimes we mistake things that are in our periphery, they're, they're in the newspaper, they're on CNN as important to us. We really need to understand foundationally what's really important and how do we need to evolve or change and not get caught up in the riptide of the noise out there that doesn't really have to do with our business. Stay focused on your fundamentals, Look at your value proposition and really understand where you and your team deserve to win and then go win in that space. Everybody, I always tell everybody, uh, Rich, on every episode, there's a spot where the, it's worth the whole episode. And there's been like four of them in this one, but that was one of them right there. Everyone needs to think about that, what you just talked about, about change management, because I think we, it takes us back to our busy comment. Right? right? And we're also busy. And then we think we got all this change and everyone wants to say, and everyone will nod. Yeah. Change is going at an ever increasing rate. Yes. And what's really important. I think what you said is so valuable. And if people will take that in, uh, it to heart and to action, it'll make a big difference for themselves and for their businesses. Third word, teamwork. 
teamwork. Very important, yet today what we're seeing is that of the, the great companies are driven by individual contribution as well as team contribution. So if you're in a team setting, don't, don't underestimate your individual value that you can bring and continue to, to ramp up your skill sets, your knowledge base. Um, you know, Kevin, you're doing a lot of great work with, with the, the distance and the leadership piece. That's something that we can't underestimate. While you're leading a team, you still have to get back to the fundamentals. You have to be able to, to, be able to, to produce value and, and contribute individually as well as a team member. So don't abdicate your responsibility for getting better to a team. Oh, good stuff, man. So uh, we're, we're in the short rows. We're almost done. I've only have, I only have three more questions for you. And the first one is, so when you're not gallivanting around the world, helping people with strategy or writing new comic um, and graphic novels, um, what do you do for fun? So uh, I've got two teenagers. So I'm busy on the weekends with a lot of sporting events. Um, whether it's volleyball or track or tennis or basketball. So that takes up a lot of time, which I love. It's a, it's a great, great time to spend with the kids. And then I also enjoy um, shooting sporting clays. So with, uh, it's, it's a, you know, from a target perspective, it's fun to get out there and concentrate on that a little bit. So I can tell you that I'm not good at that, but I can tell you that I have a cousin who has, who we can shoot him. He has the, he has the clays and he has the shooter and all that stuff. And we have actually tried to hit them with my potato gun. So just so you know, <laughs> um, I love um, it. now everyone who's listening has a whole new, and there's some people listening that are laughing because they were there um, when we actually <laughs> tried to do that. But anyway, so um, what, what are you reading now? So we've talked about how busy you are with work and with your kids and everything. And so, but what are you, what are you reading? What's something you've read recently that people might find interesting? So, you know, it's funny, and, and you can appreciate this as a fellow author, you know, when I'm writing a book or in, in this type of project, I try not to really read any business related books because I don't want it to, you know, to, 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 to muddy the, the thinking that's going on in my own project. So I try to read books that are kind of off the, the beaten path a little bit. So this summer, I've been read, reading a book called Winning Ugly by Brad Gilbert. And for any tennis fans out there, Brad Gilbert was he was a tennis player, and he'll admit he was kind of a ham and egger. He was not a, one of the most talented guys, but he had a lot of success beating some of the talented people of his era, like Jimmy Connors and Boris Becker and John McEnroe. And in the book, it's a really interesting um, take on strategy because he, he breaks down each of his opponents and matches and talks about how he transformed their opponent, the opponent's strengths into weaknesses which he could exploit even though he was the less talented player. So that's been a really fun read because it's strategy related, but but not really from a business perspective. Well, and, and back to our, our point earlier, strategic thinking, thinking strategically, right? Um, which, is, which is excellent. So that's winning ugly. Um, the book that we've been talking about with Rich is called Strategy Man versus the Anti-Strategy Squad. And uh, where can we learn more, get the book, learn more about it, learn more about you and your work? Rich. Yeah, so uh, if, if you'd like to learn more, uh, there's a site called strategyskills.com. Um, it's got a lot of free resources on there in the shape of videos and, and audio and white papers, infographics uh, around strategy and strategic thinking. So strategyskills.com. And then the book you can pick up at Amazon or Barnes & Noble or um, you know any of those other outlets. And you know, even if you're a 50 plus year old guy, you can read a graphic novel, I promise you. So go for it. Um, so everybody, now the question for all of you who are listening, which is now what, what idea are you going to take action on? What insight, uh, really, what idea did you get today that you can transform into an insight or uh, more specifically into an action that you can take over the next few days? Because if not, this may have been useful and interesting and you may now want to go out and buy your first graphic novel uh, for business. but really we need you to be thinking about what you can take from this to get great value from. I've got a whole list of notes. I always figure everybody, there's two reasons, two ways I know if these were good, good conversations. One that I enjoy it. And two, did I take good notes? I've got, I, both are true for me today. So Rich, thanks for being here. It's a pleasure. It was a pleasure to have you. Kevin, great to chat with you as well and continued success with, uh, with your books also. Thanks. And everybody, if you like this one, we're here every week. Now, not every week do we have a graphic, a graphic novelist, but every week we have a new uh, expert to help you think about leading more effectively, becoming a better leader and becoming a better human being. 
that's why we're here. We're here every week on the Remarkable Leadership Podcast.